Well, thanks for coming. And uh, well, I am Ali Dehkan Tanha. I am a Canada researcher in cybersecurity and threat intelligence and a professor of cybersecurity in the University of Guelph. Uh, today's talk would be about safeguarding against cyber attacks in ag food. I'm going to share some background about the cyber attacks in this sector, uh, what we have observed and what some of the cases that we have uh, helped with and the actions that can be taken moving forward. So, critical infrastructure has always been a major target for attackers. We have seen attacks, high profile attacks everywhere in the critical infra infrastructure sector from pipelines to election systems to more recently uh, you are seeing even uh, attacks on the refineries, etc., etc. So if we are working, if any organization is working on the critical infrastructure, they are considered as a main target for the attackers, as valuable targets for the attackers. I will later on discuss about the different types of attackers that we have, specifically active in the ag and food sector. But ag and food being one of the critical infrastructure in Canada is targeted by the attackers and uh, they are going after that. As you can see, there were like many uh, stories in the ag and food, like the uh, JBS food that have been attacked, even on the healthcare that we have attacks and the shutdown of the US pipeline. But these are not limited only to those sectors. Flock of chickens held by ransom, activist target hog, uh, hog farm with ransomware. Those are the news that you can see and you can hear around yourself that nowadays attackers are coming after the ag and food sector. And usually the question that I get right at this point is why? Why attackers are coming after this sector? You know, a few weeks ago, uh, we were called uh, for an investigation of a case that uh, a ransomware has hit a dairy farm. That was quite a modern mechanized dairy farm. They have like monitors everywhere that shows what is happening in every row. And then they have robots, milking robots, etc., etc. That's all of them very impacted by the ransomware attack. I will give you another example later on. It took us like two days to just conduct the investigation, decrypt the information, and recover from the attack. And on the last day, we had a briefing with the business owner about what we have done and the lessons that have been learned. And the first question he asked me is, he was just pointing to me and say, Ali, why these attackers came after me, a farmer in Southern Ontario, instead of going to Lycov University of Guelph, he was naming some banks, and I was like, Hackers would not discriminate, and they are always looking for low-hanging fruit. If you have an environment, a farm, that can be remotely accessed, and that remote access could be for you to check the status of your farm, or it could be that you have a software, that that software sends some data to a server on a specific interval, that could be as much as that. That means that the attackers are able to find you, to scan and find you. And if they find that you are vulnerable and it takes them, I don't know, five minutes to hack you, they would come after you, right? Because five minutes of their time, they can get onto you, put their ransom there, and ask you to make the payment, right? So that's usually the main reason in the ag and food sector that we see quite a number of attacks. A lot of targets in this field are quite low-hanging fruits. There is really no cybersecurity, defense, protection, or even detection mechanism in place, and that's why they become a prime target. You know, a few years ago, like three, four years ago, we were looking at the healthcare sector as the soft belly for, or, uh, for the attack in the cyber world in Canada. These days, I can say that it is the ag sector that is becoming that most vulnerable, widely accessible in this specific type of, for this specific type of attacks. Right, so <clears throat> I told you I'm going to give you an example. This is one of the examples, right, that of course is anonymized, but uh, this is just what, as it happens in the real world. So uh, it was quite light, late at night that I received a call from one of these uh, dairy farm owners that they ask for the help, that they are saying a ransomware targeting their systems. So in like about seven hours, around 80 servers that they were on the environment has been compromised and have been encrypted, right? And then they give us a call asking for help, right? Or what can be done? 
You know, and usually, just for your information, that's a really fun fact, most of these attacks are happening at the weekend or during holidays because they know that the targets are having less resources to ask for help, right? So if any of you decided to come to cybersecurity area, just, just, just note that you probably won't have any vacation, any holiday, because that, those are the exact time that the attackers are quite active. Anyway, they have called us and uh, asked for help there. When we were on the scene, we find out that the attackers are claiming that the victim, in this case our client, have been paid them twice before, and they are now asking for a third payment. And I was asking them, why did you pay them twice? And they were like, they were not asking for that much, so it was easier to just pay them and get back to normal business, right? And this time, the attackers get quite greedy, otherwise probably they would not call, they would just pay and go ahead, right? But anyway. So in this case, we have done the investigation. We find that this specific ransomware was quite an old ransomware, so we could find the keys to decrypt the information. We decrypted the information. We find out how the attackers came in at the first place, stopped that from happening again, and that was it. We recovered the business. It took us like, I don't know, a few hours to recover everything, all the data that had been lost. And on this spot, I was asking the business owner to please let us to keep monitoring your network for at least a few months, because usually if you have had attackers that have compromised your environment a couple of times, they had a very good view of your network, of your environment, and they probably would come back. But for some reasons, the IT team thinks that they are good. They are good now, and we can leave, right? So, and as you know, these things happen again. I don't forget that day, 11th April 2023, because I was a keynote speaker in another conference. I was on the way to the conference and they called me and said, Ali, we have been hacked again. This time, not only our computers, but our milking robots, all our data have been stolen. And now they are returning that they have even footage of our environment that they can share. They have all our data that they can put on the dark web for selling if you are not paying them. And I just called the conference and tell them that, guys, I need to move my, key, my talk to another day because I have someone needing my help now, right? So that's why I never forget that. But when I get back there, I was the first time in my life I was seeing one of those big milking robot systems fully encrypted, right? Not responding to the vendors, right? Not doing anything, it was just encrypted, you know? And I was on the scene, there were like three other vendors on the scene as well, and no one was there touching any system because they were on the call with the legal team and the legal team were advising that we are only responsible for our own data, not for the other vendor data. If you touch any of that vendor data, we may be in trouble. So the client left with no choice. The client was relying on the vendors and on those situations that multiple devices from multiple vendors have been impacted, no one could help because that ransom was everywhere in the network. If you recover one of the devices without recovering the rest, the ransom again encrypt that machine, right? So that was the time that they just valued the need for cybersecurity professionals because when you are having a cybersecurity professional, they would sign an agreement with you and regardless of the vendor that you have, they are going to get there, help you and recover all the information, right? So that was the biggest lesson for that business owner, right? That even though that you might be attacked once or twice, you still need to have a proper security monitoring in place to stop those attackers from coming back. There is a sad fact, and that's like a fact supported by the numbers, that approximately 60% of small businesses go bankrupt six months after having a cyber attack. That's either because of the direct impact of the cyber attack, losing data, asking for ransom to be paid, or the indirect impact of that, reputation damage, right? You see one of the biggest ones, right? Or even sometimes you will see that the information of the client have been leaked, and then they get sued by the clients, right? So for example, in this specific ag sector, I was involved in a case that one farm server have been used to attack a big bank. And that those attackers were successful in compromising that big bank because, uh, because the bank giving access to that farmers. And when that investigation happened, bank came back and sued that farmer saying that you did not have enough security in place. And because of your privileged access to your bank, we get compromised. 
So you could find yourself, the farmers could find themselves in the middle of a multi-million dollar case just because of not having enough cybersecurity in place to show that we have done what we could. It's not an expectation that the farmers would have the same level of security as the banks, no. But you should be able to show that you have enough level of security in relation to your size of business, in relation to what you are doing, you try to protect yourself, right? And protect the data that you have or you're producing, right? So that was one of the biggest profile cases that we have investigated. I don't want to give a lot background on cybersecurity, but just a quick one that when you look into cybersecurity, you can identify five different layers. The first layer is secure architecture. That means you are having access control, like your username and a password in place. You are having the systems regularly patched and up to date, so they are not being attacked. The second layer are passive defense mechanism. These are the mechanisms that are monitoring your environment and try to identify if the attackers are there, like firewalls, right? That they try, or IDSs that they can uh, passively monitor. The next layer are active defense. That's when you are having cybersecurity professionals actively looking after attackers who could bypass and they are in your network. The next layer is intelligence. That's when you are using the information from the hacking groups to find them, to, uh, to uh, identify them in your network. And the last layer is offense, which means you are attacking the attacker's infrastructure. In the ag and food sector, what we normally need are these two first two layers to make sure that we have a secure architecture and we have some passive defense mechanism in place. That's the usual expectation that are expected from businesses in this environment. If you can show that you have a secure architecture, which means like a strong passwords, patching in place as an example, there could be other examples, as well as some mechanism that you can monitor your network. You can find if you have been compromised, right? You know, one of the things that happened, I was in another conference at the uh, AFC AGM like a few weeks ago, and in the room I was asking that, anybody has witnessed any cyber attack before? There were like a couple of hands went up because they were like actually impacted by ransomware. And I asked the rest of the room that, do you have any way to find out if you have been compromised? And no one even had any means to know that, right? And that's usually the case, you know. We are being called usually very late at the stage, right? Which means we are being called when the victim is seeing something observable, like a ransomware. But the attackers could be in your environment ages before, weeks or months before, stealing the information, encrypting the data, up until the stage that you could identify them without any investigation, right? And you know, that's the thing that the attackers are aware as well, they know that if they do things like ransomware, the user would notify and would understand their presence, right? So that's usually the very last step. That's what we do with many clients, that if you notice a ransomware, that means attackers are done with your system. They exfiltrate it, they steal the information that they want. That could be your credit card, that could be your client information, it could be your own information. And when they are done with everything and they see no other value, they put the ransomware, right? Because then they know that you would know, you would be aware of them, right? of their presence. So, who are the main threat actors in the ag and food sector? There are three main actors that we have seen in this specific sector. First, like everywhere, opportunistic cyber criminals. Right? These are the major actors, threat actors in this field. They are opportunistic, meaning they are looking for low-hanging fruit, as I told you, right? So they they evaluate their targets and they just choose the best target that gets them the minimum of time and maximum return that they can have, right? There are a ton of them in active in the ag and food sector and we have seen all sorts of attack from data breach to ransomware and even they are coming back, keep coming back to the environment and asking for more, right? So that's one thing that you should be aware of. If you decide, if any business decides to pay to the attackers first, you would be legally liable, so if law enforcement agencies understand that you are doing, you would be constantly, you have conducted a crime and they can come after you, that's one thing. But second is, don't think that if you pay them, they will not come back, they will come back, right? It's just a matter of time, right? When they are done and they will come back again and ask for more. The next group of the hackers that we have seen in this environment are state-sponsored hacking teams, right? Specifically, 
in, in the cases that we have investigated, which are mainly focused on the, north, uh, on the South Ontario, we have seen APT-26, which is a Chinese hacking, hacking team, very active here, and Orange Worm, which is an Iranian hacking team, that they are very actively compromising sensors, devices, environments that are in the food supply chain. It's not only on the farmers, but anywhere in the supply chain. So we have seen them being active at even ports, that the food, foods are coming and going, all the way to the farmers, all the way to the food processing centers, right? So these two groups are standing out because of the number of cases that we have seen, right? And you know, uh, these state-sponsored hacking teams' risk are normally not in the interest of the individual farmers because they cannot do much about it, right? They, they have skill sets that they can compromise the devices, the, the networks, et cetera, et cetera. But this is good that when we talk with AFC and others, we keep, 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 keep them informed about the risk that the Chinese and Iranians are interested. They are coming on these machines and we need to think about why they are here and what they are doing. But the third risk that is quite new, we have seen the first case in July 2023 are the animal activists. Right? And that was a big change for us, you know? That was the first case that we have seen that animal activists just drop around somewhere and instead of asking for money, they were asking the business owner to go public and publicly confess about the cruelty that they have against animals. They were pretending that they have video footage that they have done that. If they are not going themselves, they would publish it publicly. And you know, when you are dealing with this kind of case, the situation is very difficult. You know, when you deal with the cyber criminals, you know their tactics. You know that they are there to get paid, right? Eventually, if we cannot recover, we will go and negotiate with them. But when you are dealing with activists, they are not there for the money, right? They are there to cause the damage, right? Well, that was the first time that we were seeing a ransomware that has been that explicit message that we have it, all those things and we have encrypted the information, we don't need you to pay whatsoever, we will decrypt the minute that you release the footage publicly. So what we did in that case was, we were lucky because apparently those groups were not that advanced, they were using one of those old ransomwares that we had the decryption key, and by the way, if you have hit by the ransomware for anyone, most of the ransomwares, like 90% of them, can be decrypted, right? So we have decryption key and they are available and if you talk to uh, security professionals, they can help a lot there, right? So we decrypt it and then we conduct an investigation and we find out that no information has been stolen, exfiltrated from this network. So the claim that the attackers had that they have footage is not true, so we could recover and we operated the, the network for them to not come back, right? But I, can, I am seeing this risk of the activists as quite a growing risk. We are monitoring dark net, dark web carefully for any communication, any claim from these groups that they are looking for ransomwares or they are looking for targets, right? To see how they are evolving. But we have seen the first case and I can tell you that our view is quite limited to the South and Ontario, right? The case could be much bigger than that, right? That we have not observed them yet. But if these groups are becoming active, they could become a big problem, right? A big issue for <coughs> everyone in the industry. So, why? Why the cybersecurity is quite low or does not exist in the ag and food? When you compare the size of the ag and food market and compare it with the uh, amounts that they are spending in cybersecurity, you find that in other areas of critical infrastructure, usually two to three percent of the annual revenue of the companies is spent in cybersecurity. In the ag sector, it is less than one percent, close to one percent, right? And it is even the data that we have was mixed between the IT and security. That's, that's, that can give you a very good view of why we do not see enough security protection in place in a specific sector. Simply, the level of investment in cybersecurity in this sector is much lower than the other sectors, right? That's a sad fact because on the other side, most of the businesses in the ag and food are considered as a small business. As I told you earlier, 60% of small businesses go bankrupt after cyber attack, which means this specific sector with low investment in cybersecurity and having a lot of small businesses being active there is quite vulnerable. And when they hit, coming back to the business may not be easy. So 
It's not all bad news. At University of Guelph, with the support of OMAFRA, we have developed a system for security monitoring for the ag and food. Uh, this system has the sensors uh, that could install on all your devices, from your milking robots to your uh, computers, software, mobile phones, and they would stream the security, the inf important security information to our servers, so we can offer a full security monitoring to any farmers who are interested to be monitored and to be protected, right? So we have built that system, and that's accessible. If you want, you just write me an email, send me an email, or just contact anyone at the UOG, and they can link you, and we can get you up with that security monitoring system. The next thing that should be done is awareness, right? That's why I am here. That's the exact reason I am here, right? To increase awareness, right? Just be aware, this is a growing risk. With the more and more technology that you deploy on the field, I can share you another story that was not on my slide, but that was quite recent, that the attackers have compromised the identity detection system, the fobs that they put in the, uh, at the uh, cause. Uh, so they encrypted that system so the cause could not be detected by the milking system and the farm was down, right? So you could see that the attackers are becoming more aware that instead of going for like a robot, they could go for a fobs and when they just encrypt those fobs, because the cause cannot be detected, all the other systems are failing. The system that sends the data is failing, the system that sends the milking is failing, right? So they are coming after and they become much more organized and careful in the way that they run their attacks. So awareness is the main thing, and uh, so if you, be, if you are aware of AFC, it's just sending periodical emails at the UOG. We have created web pages to, uh, improve awareness about the attacks that are happening in this field. And we are trying to attend to the events like this that are more inclusive of the farmers, dairy owners, right, to inform them about the risk and the threats here. We are running workshops, many of them throughout the year, right, like three or four every year, about the cybersecurity that is open to the interested parties and you can attend them. And we do have tabletop exercises, which means uh, we are assuming that you have been compromised and we tell you what you should do, right? So you go through the scenario live, when you should call, what you should expect, what agreements should have in place, who you should call, what they would do when they are on the scene, how they help you, and what actions you need to take after the attack. Another aspect of our work is we are working with standard organizations to set the standard for cybersecurity in this sector too. We understand that the international cybersecurity standards like ISO 27001, etc., are too much for this sector. No one can comply with that. So there is a need to create a standards for the people, for the organization, for the farmers in this field that they can meet and they can gradually improve upon. Having a standards are not only important for the farmers, but even for technology developers. If you're a technology company, if you know what security standard you should meet, you would aim for it, and that would differentiate yourself in the market, so that, that, that we believe that would help a lot in the ag tech sector as well, when we have clearly defined standards, and that would help consumers as well, that when they go to the uh, solution providers, they ask for a specific standard. So do you meet the standard level A or B or C in cybersecurity. That would make the communication much more easier, right? So that's the other thing that you are currently working with the standard organization to build a standard for cybersecurity in this specific sector. And the other thing that we do is we are working with the uh, insurance companies as well as the credit companies like RBC, like Farm Credit Canada. So they would consider cybersecurity as one of the criteria when they give loans or they do the insurance, right? So if you meet cybersecurity requirements, you will get discounts, and that's another conversation, ongoing conversation that we have with both, uh, both of these organizations at the moment. Well, in this room, maybe less, but when I'm delivering this in the cybersecurity, community, there are people here that they are asking for emulation of the attacks and team exercise. We do offer that in the University of Guelph as well. So we do have the infrastructure that is like a simulated dairy or a simulated chicken barn, and then we attack them live. So in a simulated environment, the next generation can learn how the attackers are running the attack and how they can defend. If that's in your interest, again, we do a lot of sandboxing 
um, exercises at the UOG, which includes sandboxes for the ag and food sector. But the main thing that we do, one of the main thing is help to train the next generation. You know, cybersecurity is quite field specific. You cannot get the general cybersecurity and apply it to all domains. Cybersecurity in the banking sector is quite different than the pipeline, and it's quite different in ag and food, right? So I can give you an example. You know, in the cybersecurity, one of the examples that everyone gives is like, you should change your password, and you should make your password unique and very difficult to guess. But imagine that you want to change the password of your milking robot. How can you do that? Right? And you know, that's the case for many other devices, many other uh, smart ag devices that you see on the field. Whenever I talk to business owners and present them with two risks, the risk of attackers attacking their system with a default password in compare with them changing the password so the vendor cannot help them or the new employee cannot connect to that device, they always say that the risk of losing vendor is much higher than the attackers. So this environment is different. You cannot expect the people who have been trained in traditional cybersecurity to come and help here. You know, you are seeing, and we have seen that as well, that for example, in the ag and food, people are suggesting to just go and patch your system. Patching what? Patching a fob? Patching a milking robot? Have you even seen those devices? I fully understand that most of those solutions are not applicable here. For this environment, we have designed design a solution specifically working for the farmers, right? So for example, for your milking robot, you need to separate that network, that separate the robot from the rest of your network. That's a solution you have. The solution is not putting password, the solution is not patching it, right? The solution is separating it, right? Or for example, when you look into the user agreement of many of these smart farming devices, they are not allowing the farmer farmers or anyone to uh, scan the device, which means n you cannot install antivirus on those environments because the antivirus would go and uh, scan the device. And imagine you just put an antivirus and you lose the guarantee of that multi-million dollar device. No one is going to accept that risk. So we are going to come with, uh, with different solutions. And that's why we are building training programs uh, specifically to train cybersecurity experts in the ag and food sector. That's an ongoing project that we have in the University of Guelph. We are having master or PhD students are completely trained for cybersecurity challenges in this specific sector. And we always look for partners. So if that's an interest of you and you want all the students to come and help you or you want to contribute to those programs, just give us a shout, right? And we always build these programs. And as I told you, our main mission always is to train the worker. Regardless of how many technologies that we build, regardless of how advanced we are, if the worker is not properly trained, all of those would fail in the hands of a small and even junior attacker. Thanks for your attention.